Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. So, I have been asked several times about a video that can be found on YouTube wherein Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, criticizes the Islamic scientific tradition. What he does is he begins with a list of stars and he shows how all of these stars have, or the majority of these stars, have Arabic names. And then he talks about how in the golden age of Islamic civilization, of the Abbasid era, and he identifies this as being from about 800 to 1100, Islam led the world in scientific investigation, particularly centered in Baghdad, though of course there were other cities within such activities occurred. And then he goes on and he asks the question, so what happened? And he provides an answer that is unfortunately uh, incorrect and very misleading. It's also quite simplistic. He says that Abu Hamad al-Ghazali in the year 1111, or who died in the year 1111, but in his works that he says Abu Hamad al-Ghazali said that mathematics is satanic and that it is therefore a forbidden practice. And then he goes on to say that this led to a great decline in the practices of, the, of mathematics and the sciences in the Islamic world. Now this is incorrect on several counts, and I'm going to address two of them here. First, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali did not say that mathematics is satanic. And secondly, there was not a decline in mathematics after the death of Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. In fact, if you were to identify what we could call the golden age of astronomy in the Islamic world, it was yet to come. The observatories of Maraghe and Samarkand, founded in the 13th and 15th centuries respectively, uh, were probably two of the greatest observatories that the Islamic world had ever known. And many of the stars that have Arabic names were in fact discovered at those two observatories. Now let me go back and address the first issue here, which is uh, what Abu Hamad al-Ghazali actually said regarding mathematics. Now Abu Hamad al-Ghazali probably addresses it in several places. The two places where I've come across his discussions of it are his autobiography, al munqidh min al The Deliverer from Error, and his magnum opus, the Ihya al Revival of the Religious Sciences. And here is the first volume of the 10-volume uh, Arabic edition that recently came out, um, which is really an excellent edition of this book. Now, in the Kitab al-Ilm, the Book of Knowledge, which is the first book of the 40-book um, Ihya al din Abu Hamad al-Ghazali talks about mathematics in several places because he's trying to talk about all of the different sciences and how he thinks they should be related to one another. So I'm going to read for you from this translation uh, by Kenneth Honorkamp of the Book of Knowledge of the, of the Ihya al din Here's what he says, and it's found on page 38. And I'm reading so you know I don't, I haven't made this up myself. He says, as for the praiseworthy disciplines, such as medicine and mathematics, they are associated with worldly benefit, and that category is divided into those that become a communal obligation, the farikifaya, and those that are of great merit, but are not an obligation. Now, the fact that he has referred to them as a farikifaya um, means that he sees that they are actually necessary and play a necessary function within Islamic civilization. He, in fact, goes on to say that if there are not people who are experts in mathematics within society, that it will be a hardship on society and certain aspects of society will suffer from it. So he clearly sees this as, uh, as an obligation and as something that is necessary. He goes on to say in what is page 56 of the translation um, that this is a praiseworthy discipline, but that nonetheless, if you fear that somebody will exceed the bounds in it, they should be prevented from their study in it. Now, this is not a way in which Abu Hamad al-Ghazali is trying to limit mathematics itself. Because in fact, he says this about every intellectual discipline. 
any intellectual discipline in which people are going to use their knowledge for ends that will bring corruption to themselves or to society, he says is something that should be restrained. Now, the main way in which people do this is actually through their ego, through trying to practice something in order to gain fame for it. Um, and then there are other ways that people can use such knowledge to actually abuse other members of civilization. And in fact, Al-Ghazali doesn't really say all that much about mathematics in his works regarding this. He's far more critical of the ulama, that is the people who are practitioners of fiqh, of jurisprudence, and people who are practitioners of kalam, and sees ways in which these disciplines can be violated, and in which they have been violated by many of their practitioners. Nonetheless, what Abu Hamad al-Ghazali is doing here is actually arguing for the purity of knowledge. Abu Hamad al-Ghazali stated that the end of the human being is knowledge, and that knowledge is the highest thing that the human being can achieve. Uh, where he thinks mathematics sits within this is different than what somebody might think today. It is also different than probably what Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks, but he in no way says that this is satanic and does not say that people must not study it. Now, what Abu Hamad al-Ghazali says was not even accepted by everyone. There was a lively, continuous debate regarding many of the points that he brought up. Many people disagreed with him. It was a culture of intense intellectual fervor. Nobody was going to say, well, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali said this, therefore we'll do it this way. Uh, many of his works were debated. Now, as regards the second part of Neil deGrasse Tyson's contention, he says that after Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, the sciences declined. There is simply nothing in the historical record to substantiate this. The sciences in the Islamic world went on well into the Ottoman period. In fact, there's a new book coming out on, uh, on Islamic uh, science, or well, not Islamic, but on science uh, and technology in the Ottoman period. It should be out in April. Um, and that is something that's April of 2018. And, uh, and that's something I hope to look at. But let's go immediately to some of the people who followed Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. His uh, younger contemporary, um, Omar Khayyam, who is better known in the West, for his works in poetry, he actually wrote um, books on algebra, and he and his works on algebra continued to be studied for several hundred years. And uh, he is known for having uh, systematized ways to approach quadratic equations and some higher level equations. But more importantly, uh, Nasir Din Tusi, who died in the year 1274 and actually wrote some of his philosophical works defending certain contentions of Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, he was probably uh, one of the most important astronomers in all of history. He convinced the leader of his time to found the observatory at Marare in north, uh, northwestern Iran, and, uh, and he himself wrote 125 works on philosophy, theology, science, mathematics, etc. Uh, his, he has a five-volume work that's just on, uh, on mathematics. His work on, uh, on the knowledge of, the, of astronomy uh, was uh, very influential, and people continued to write commentaries on it into the 16th century. The last great commentary is probably that of Abd Ali Muhammad al-Birjandi. Al-Birjandi's commentary on... Um, on Atusi's Tathkirat fi Ilm al Hayya, that is, um, a memoir or a discussion of the knowledge of, uh, of the cosmos, um, continued to be studied into the 17th century. Al Birjandi died in the late 16th century. So, this was really a continuous culture of mathematical and astronomical investigation. The first person to have actually empirically demonstrated that the Earth rotates is Ali al Qushji, uh, who began in Samarkand, at the observatory in Samarkand that was founded there in 1420, and then he moved to the Ottoman Empire, where he was extremely influential and had many students. He actually had two works that were translated into Latin, at least two that I know of, 
that were translated into Latin, one on mathematics and one on astronomy, and were published in the year 1650 in Latin, showing that it was uh, thought that the mathematical knowledge that came from parts of the Islamic world at that time was important for study within the Latin West. Now, these are only a few examples. We could go on and you could just list name after name after name. And there are indeed scholars of mathematics and astronomy who are much better qualified than myself to do this. One could also go into the natural sciences and discuss people such as Ibn Nafis and Ibn Qush, who were the first people to identify uh, the function of the pulmonary system, to identify capillaries. Ibn Qush in the 13th century was the first person to identify the function of the heart valve and how it actually works. Um, so all areas of technological, mathematical investigation, scientific investigation, continued to thrive after Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. In the last 200 years, there has indeed been a grave decline in many parts of the Islamic world in scientific investigation. And there are various geopolitical factors that contribute to that, and unfortunately, there are some parts of the Islamic world today where in theoretical mathematics and science for the sake of science is not prioritized, but only the technological application of it. And that's a problem. But it is not something that can be uh, taken back to Abu Hamad al-Ghazali and can be attributed to him in any way. And it really is not something that is inherent to classical Islamic civilization. In fact, in classical Islamic civilization, there was seen as being a, uh, a wedding between the knowledge of the earth and the knowledge that we derive through empirical investigation and religious knowledge. So this idea that they were somehow um, separate from one another and that religion in the classical Islamic period overcame uh, scientific investigation and relegated it to some dark corner of society is simply not correct. It might be part of a narrative that many people wish to advance nowadays, but it is not in fact substantiated by the historical record. Thank you very much. This is my first YouTube video on such a thing and I'm responding to requests that I've gotten and questions I've gotten from several people. If there are other videos that you would like to see, please just mention them in the comments section. Thank you. Goodbye.